Okay, so let's move on to number three, which is, is somewhat related to China, but it's actually much more. The, the supply uh, kind of uh, chain management, we, we're seeing more and more problems all around the world. What do you think is driving that and what does that mean for investors? Yeah, so, so if you look at slide 74, we show ISM prices uh, indices, um, prices paid for manufacturing and services. And you know they're off their highs, but if you draw a straight line back from the most recent data points to the, 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 the left side of the time series, it's very clear that we're still in very elevated conditions. If you look at slide 75, we show the Baltic Dry Index relative to two-year break-evens. And Baltic Dry is still making highs. Two-year break-evens are very much still at their highs. You know, so what we're saying here is, look, past peak supply chain disruptions are, you know, does not mean there are no supply chain disruptions. And you actually might see them accelerate if you think about the energy crisis in Europe, you know, kind of spilling over into the broader global economy, you know, through the lens of rising crude oil and natural gas prices, which, by the way, we're both along both of those assets. Um, on slide 76, you know, it hasn't really impacted earnings that much yet. But on slide 77, if you look at the sort of second and third derivative of, of the chart on slide 77, which is, you know, Russell 3000 cyclicals, you know, next 12 month earnings expectations, they're actually starting to very marginally tick down. And I certainly think, you know, as we get through and progress through Q3 earnings season, we actually might get a reset of earnings growth expectations on a next 12 month forward basis. And the reason for that is, look, you heard it from Micron with respect to semis. You heard it from Nike with respect to selling people, you know, $150 shoes. You heard it from Bet Blood Bath and Beyond with respect to selling people shit that they don't want in their house. <laughs> <laughs> like, look, the supply chain disruptions are having an impact on the economy. You can see it on slide 79, 78. 78 is like showing auto sales. It's like we can't manufacture enough cars to sell people. Right. And that's obviously, you know, these auto sales down in the most recent month, down 80% annualized. Which brings us to the next question, which is inflation. And you said it's both transitory and uh, kind of secular. Why don't you walk us through your thinking there? Yeah, so I, I, this is, to me, this is the key debate of the, the day. And I, I do believe we, we should spend some time, you know, kind of unpacking, you know, both the transitory and persistent um, categories. So I'll start with transitory. Slide 27 just shows our inflation projections. Again, we, we run two separate models. Uh, to project uh, growth and inflation, 42 macro for every economy. The same models, just different, obviously, inputs. Uh, but, you know, both you know both models are saying, hey, look, inflation is coming down on a rate of change basis over the next 12 months. That's slide 27. You look at slide, you know, 50, in terms of where we kind of started at the pandemic with, you know, the next series of charts will kind of walk you through what we're thinking on that. Slide 50 just shows our analysis for demographics. I won't, you know, I, I, I don't want to unpack the chart on a, on a podcast. You know, I'll let the users or the listeners kind of um, dig into it themselves. But the reality is our demographic situation hasn't changed. Slide 51, the secular drivers of disinflation are still intact. You know, you look at, you know, the dominance or the decline in the labor force participation rate, which is accelerated to the downside in COVID. You look at the decline in money velocity, which is accelerated to the downside in COVID. You look at the, the dominance of technology and the proliferation of the digital economy space and all the disinflation that comes with that um, accelerated in COVID. And then the only thing that is not accelerating in COVID, but is still pretty elevated, um, is, you know, sort of globalization. And we, we sort of use uh, the imports of goods and services as a percent of GDP uh, as a proxy for globalization. None of those things have changed materially. And if you add it up on a net basis, it probably means there's more disinflation in the economy. And, and if you look at slide 52, I would argue it's kind of saying the same thing. You know, some of these longer term drivers of disinflation. The blue line on slide 52 shows the market cap of the S&P 100, the 100 largest stocks in the S&P 500 as a ratio to the 500, uh, the, you know, the, the, the broader index. And that's up into the right, you know, through COVID. And that's telling you that, you know, monopsony power still is very much intact in this economy. In so much that the red line shows the, the employment, you know, the, the ratio of employment relative to consumption of fixed capital or CapEx. Is down into the down to the right as well. So you know, businesses still have bargaining power. They might not in this you know particular window of time where everybody's rushing to buy over order goods, get ahead of the Christmas rush, things of that nature. You know, we're we're living in this very you know hot inflation moment. But none of this stuff has changed with respect to the longer term outlook in inflation. And that to me is why you're seeing slide fifty three through kind of fifty seven, fifty eight. You're seeing inflation momentum start to wane, even as we you know keep you know yelling, shouting from the rooftops about inflation. Headline CPI is waning on slide 53. Look at the bottom panel of those charts. Core CPI momentum has been cut by 90 percent from its peak. You know, airfares, used cars, all that stuff's down, and ultimately core PCE momentum is decelerating as well. So that's you know that's my kind of longer term view. It's like look, 
unless you tell me something is materially changed, you got to you you have to respect and acknowledge the, the the base effects in the time series and the rate of change of the time series. Now, you, we alluded to this, Kevin. <laughs> I say that to say this: that doesn't mean we're going to bottom at the same levels that we have historically bottomed at in previous cycles. The stationary, and this is about the nerdiest thing I'm going to say on this podcast. And mind you, to your listeners, I'm. Two, I'm two glasses of whispering angel deep here. So. so that's right. We actually take. You should take a moment to. Um, we didn't. We didn't talk about the fact that you are a true huddler. You brought your yep. own booze. And yep. uh, what are you drinking? I am drinking only the finest crispest rosé from Provence. Uh, my good friends at Whispering Angel, uh, they should sponsor me in my life because I've, I've probably given them as much business as anybody, certainly through my marketing. <laughs> uh, no, I, I learned in my old age that uh, I can't drink beer without getting hungover. So I switched to uh, Whispering Angel and it makes me uh, able to wake up at 430 in the morning. And, and, that, and that is a rosé, right? Yes, it is. It okay, is. so Absolutely. Lena, hop on. Lena usually doesn't get on for the guests, but she's getting on now. Sorry, I was Lena. Right. There we go. Lena, what's She's up? there. What's up? Lena, yes. what is rosé? Cougar juice. <laughs> cougar juice. So, so all my cougar juice said... love rosé. Lena, you you unpack. You just you just open up Pandora's box. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I this also I'm I'm 34 now. At 30, I was probably extremely attractive. You know, according to several sources, not not myself. <laughs> Your mom? I could not watch. <laughs> yes, I'm sure she thought that too. Um, anyway, I could not walk into a room in New York City without any woman above the age of 40 to 45, like uh, throwing themselves at me. See, there you go. They knew you, they knew you loved Rosé. They knew it. It's cougar, Lena, it's cougar juice. They could smell it from miles away. Yeah, they, they know that was it. It was the pheromones or whatever. <laughs> Oh my God! All right, sorry. Let's, okay. let's get back to inflation. <laughs> this is where. <laughs> Thanks, Lena. So tell Lena. us the, now. You're going to tell us the secular story of inflation. Yeah, yeah. So, so to me, it's really about the the stationary mean of the time series. So let's go back to where we started the inflation discussion. Back to slide 27. And if you look at the left chart on slide 27, you see that there's you know pretty at least past the you know basically since the post crisis era. You know, if you look at headline CPI in particular, which we're denoting on this chart. You know, the stationary mean of this time series is somewhere around one and a half percent, right? You know, give or take. I think that number is probably closer to two and a half percent now. We won't know that as investors until we start to realize data in the you know latter part of 2022 when the red line and the chart on the right starts to bottom at a level that's much higher than one and a half percent or lower than one and a half percent. And the reason I say that is because, you know, I think a lot of your you know guests in recent past, you know, Lynn Alden's done great work on this. And a lot of people have done great work on this. And I tend to think that, you know, I, I, I'm not too far from their conclusions, which is, look, the, the, the fiscal policy dynamics in the U.S. economy have changed. And the reason they have changed goes back to my brilliant colleague, Neil Howe at, at Hedge Eye, uh, one of the smartest people in the world, by the way. Um, you know, if you go to slide 42, we show in this chart, the x-axis is the Gini coefficient. It's a measure of income dispersion. Higher is more unequal, less is more equal. And the y-axis shows the unemployment rate. And you'll notice the location of the U.S. dot relative to all the other economies, OECD economies and, and major emerging market economies on the chart. And you realize like, hey, we're, our peers are not like Germany, France, UK, Japan. It's China, Russia, Chile, Mexico. You know, we're not as far out as Brazil. But I mean, it's very, it's very clear that from the perspective of political risk through the lens of populism, the U.S. has become an emerging market economy. And the reason for that is on slide 43. The red line on slide 43 shows corporate profits, which is the mother's milk of, 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 of equity markets, according to, to, to Larry Cutlow. <laughs> I was going to say, you're channeling your, your deep Larry I'm Cutlow. Channeling my inner, my inner Cutlow. <laughs> um, the, the, the blue line shows an employee uh, compensation as a percent of the GVA, which is you know, the broadest measure of, uh, of income. And so you see that there's a very stable, is cyclical, but there was a very healthy, stable relationship with respect to that, you know, prior to 2000. And that was the sort of that was the social contract. You worked, you got paid, you could buy a house, you could afford to send your kids to college and, you know, you could afford to you know, bury your, your parents and you know, go on and so forth. That was kind of the American dream. <laughs> Ever since 2000, the American dream has been a lot closer to what I realized as a child than it has been to what, you know, you know, what I'm realizing as an adult, which is everything is too expensive. 
And it's really as a function of your wages can't keep up with the productivity and the earnings growth of the economy and, and ultimately the, the price level of every, all the goods and services people need to, to procure. And so, you know, part of the reason for that, obviously, if you think about kind of what happened at the turn of the century, you know, China joining the WTO in November 2001 was a major factor in terms of outsourcing a lot of our productive capacity. Uh, you had the repeal of Glass-Steagall, which you know led to the proliferation of the private equity industry and all the industry consolidation as a function of that. But then you also had, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the digitization of the economy and all the disinflationary impacts from there as well. Like you just don't need as many people to do stuff, right? Like I have a 101 slide, uh, slide one page presentation with, you know, a bunch of fancy models and stuff that probably take a team of six or seven economists and macro investors to put together like 20 years ago. I'm sitting here as a guy in a room on Zoom, you know, like doing this by myself now. That, that, that's a great microcosm for how disinflationary, um, you know, sort of uh, the changes in the economy have been for labor. And so that kind of takes me to my next chart with respect to why the stationary mean of inflation is likely to transpose itself higher. You look at slide 44, this shows the x-axis, the current account balance uh, uh, as a percentage of GDP. The y-axis shows the uh, sovereign fiscal balance as a percentage of GDP. And you can, again, again, we're like an outlier, the United States of America. We're like panicking as a response to COVID, you know, with respect to our fiscal policy uh, respect, res response. And it's not just COVID. It's the politicized zeitgeist in the economy that we've been getting screwed. Not we, but, you know, people like, you know, where I grew up, my, my, my friend's family, you know, we've been getting screwed this whole time. So you better throw some big bucks at the situation. And the reason we think they threw big bucks in the situation, and again, it's, it's bipartisan. This dynamic is bipartisan. We saw Black Lives Matter protests in the middle of summer 2020. We saw, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't know what they call themselves, Trump protests in the, the nation's capital in, in, in January 2021. It's this is not a political thing. This is a bunch of poor people who are freaking pissed off at the system not working for them. And so ultimately, our fiscal policymakers are now debating whether or not budget deficit should be two trillion dollars versus one trillion dollars as opposed to $500 billion versus $1 trillion. And that's a big deal long term. And it's a really big deal because on slide 45, we show that foreign central bankers don't really want to hold our debt at the margins, which means the Fed on slide 46, um, this is the Fed balance sheet as a percentage of total public debt outstanding, the Fed has to be called on to replace that gap. And if the Fed doesn't replace that gap, then guess who has to freaking pay for it? We do. Investors. Right. <laughs> you know, like we have to pay for it. And so like, that's just, to me, this is why the market on slide 48 had such a negative response to the, the June FOMC catalyst in terms of the hawkish stop plot revision, because it was the first signal, you know, go back to Jackson Hole of August 19, you know, or not August 19, August 2020, you know, the Fed basically in so many words, you know, they basically said we're, we're kind of on board with M&T, kind of, you know, they said, OK, we're going to give average inflation targeting, right. we're going to give you, um, you know, we're going to give you a maximum, they're going to try to fix racism with monetary policy in terms of maximum inclusive employment. And so we basically thought that the Fed was this MMT, had adopted an MMT framework prior to that meeting. Well, since that meeting, you saw, you know, things like terminal Fed funds, rate expectations, you know, break even interest rates, all the stuff went straight down because that was the first signal for investors that, hey, look, this Fed might not actually let the economy run as hot as we thought they were going to do. Well, that kind of changed again. And kind of this is bringing the conversation full circle on slide 49. You see that, you know, this is showing euro dollar calendar spreads. And, you know, slide, uh, the red line is 23 and the black line is 24. The black line is the most important line here. It's effectively it's bottomed and it's now starting to rise. And obviously all these lines are rising after the September FOMC when the Fed effectively said, no, 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 no. I think we said too much in June. We're going to have above target inflation as far as the eye can see. And oh, by the way, you're going to see the slowest uh, monetary policy tightening cycle in the history of U.S. economy. And right. so I think they're they're getting back towards that MMT framework, but it's not as aggressive as it was, you know, kind of at the peak of the inflation trade in early June.